Good morning, and uh, Happy New Year. Yeah, we are already into the second day of this new year, so I pray that it's uh, been good so far for you and your family, and that the rest will be blessed as well. Um, I'd ask you to look at the announcements that are printed in the bulletin. I really don't think there's uh, anything I need to uh, point out to you except to remind you that um, we have a weekly online prayer meeting every Thursday at 7 on Zoom. I've placed the address for the Zoom account there and its ID and its passcode. So if you want to join us at 7 from the comfort of your living room and spend half an hour in prayer on a Thursday night with others from the church, we are focusing our prayer time on overcoming COVID. So um, let's put our boxing gloves on and come and pray uh, for God's uh, intervention. The other thing is that you'll see at the bottom of the last of the uh, uh, last panel of the bulletin, the new COVID recommendations from the CDC that Dr. Hurley's provided. So just so that's. We don't do, I just want to say, we don't do this because we're afraid. Nothing we do is done in fear, it's done informed. I just want to emphasize that. We're not afraid and we don't act out in fear, we act out to be informed. So all the information we give you is just that so you're informed and you know what you can do uh, for yourself and, and for others. So um, thanks for, for being here and helping us to be a safe place for people to gather during this, this time. I just want to give a, you'll see in the, uh, under where it says in worship today, at the end of the service, there, there are the names of uh, some of our young people, some of whom are, uh, these are young people home from college, and, um, and they're here with us this weekend during the holiday, and so um, Beth Stahl asked if uh, they would, uh, be with us this morning uh, and share in the service. And so we are so grateful that they said yes, and we want to say thank you uh, for being here this morning uh, to help us in our worship. We, we love and appreciate you. Let's prepare our hearts this morning for worship as we listen to our, our prelude, Sunday School Jubilee.
I bet that made us uh, think back to our Sunday school days. That's great. If you're able, would you please stand so as we share the greeting together? This is Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, and it's responsive. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. family hiding from the storm found no place at the keeper's door it was for this a child was born to save a world so cold and hollow a sleeping town they did not know then lying in a manger low, a Savior King who had no home, has come to heal our sorrows. Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story. Shepherds counting sheep at night, do not fear the glory light, you are precious in his sight. God has come to raise the lowly. Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You can come as you are. It may set you apart When you make room in your heart And trade your dreams for your glory Make room in your heart Make room in your Holds the promise tight. Every wrong will be made right. The road is straight, the burdens light. For in his hands he holds tomorrow. Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart? Is there room in your heart for God to write his story? You can come as you are, it may set you apart. When you make room in your heart and trade your dreams for his glory. Make room in your heart Make 
Make room in your heart. Make room in your heart. Make room in your
O God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, by your renewing spirit, may we be enabled to share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I just want to say that was a blessing to have um, these young adults share in the service this morning, and, and thank you once again for being willing to, to use your gifts and your talents uh, to help lift us closer in our worship experience to God. Uh, sharing talents and gifts is what it, it means to be a good steward of uh, what God has given to us as followers of Jesus. We, we're, we seek to emulate our Him in our life, and uh, especially at Christmas time, uh, what is highlighted for us in the nature of Jesus um, is that He is a gift to us from God, a gift for our salvation. And the ways that we emulate that in our own life is by giving by giving of our time, of our talents, of our service, of our resources, so that others can know uh, the love of Christ in their own lives. So I thank you for your faithful stewardship um, to live out your Christian calling in, in the use of your resources and time and talents and, and everything else. There are, uh, just remind you there are offering plates in the entrances to this uh, sanctuary for you to leave a gift for the Lord and the ministry um, that he um, gives us to do here at First Church. Let's come to God in prayer. Lord, we come before your presence this morning at the beginning of a new year. Thankful for the opportunities that lie be before us. We ask, Lord, that you would give us inspiration uh, to see, to believe that you have something good and and meaningful and purposeful for us to do in the days that lie before us and in, in this very day today. So Lord, we give you thanks for your abiding presence as we enter this new year. We don't know, Lord, what this year holds, what is going to unfold. We are praying, Lord, very fervently that this will be a year in which we move out of a pandemic we are praying very fervently, Lord, today for those who are um, in the hospital and, uh, or at home and uh, needing healing and strengthening and encouragement. We lift them before you and ask, Lord, that you'll provide that for them. We think about the doctors, the nurses, the medical staff in hospitals and in, in offices. We ask, Lord, for your protection for them. And we pray, Lord, for you to encourage them, strengthen them, and for them to be able to not be overwhelmed um, by a, a spike. We are thinking today of people who are stranded in airports uh, and not able to get home. We ask, Lord, for your grace to be with them and for your sustaining uh, mercies that uh, things will fall into place so they're able to return to their homes. We're mindful, Lord, of people in Colorado who have lost their homes because of some terrible fires this week. We're mindful, Lord, of other places in this world where there is strife and uh, violence. We pray especially for Haiti and ask, Lord, for peace there. Lord, our world is broken, and you sent your son Jesus into this world to heal, and you left and gave us the charge to do your work. So help us, Lord, as the church, not just as first church, but as your universal church around the world, inspire your church wherever it is uh, to, to do your work, to be a light for Christ uh, in the midst of the darkness. And we give you praise and thanksgiving for this day and this time for us to worship. In your precious name, amen.
today comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 to 11. There's a time for everything and a seizing for everything, every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, 
A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its name. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Thank you, Hank. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, for your revelation to us, and most supremely, the revelation that you've given to us in Jesus Christ. As now we come to this passage of Scripture, we pray that you'd open our minds and our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit to hear your word for us today here. For we ask it in your precious and holy name. Amen. So I began um, New Year's Eve early in the morning by going with my wife to the watch repair shop because I had two watches that hadn't run for quite a while and I had that time, we had that time off and so we, and we had some other errands to run so I said let's stop there and I'll drop off those watches. And when I went in and uh, I laid the two watches down, um, I said, I'd, I'd like to have these repaired. And the lady yelled back to the guy that was working in the back and said, it must be the day for watch repair. So I wasn't the first one to do it. And then as I was there, there were two other guys that came in with mantle clocks. And I thought, is there something about New Year's Eve that people, and I think there must be thinking about time and think, ah, I'm going to get the watch fixed. I'm going to repair the clock. Uh, it, and it seemed to me to be, like, really appropriate. It seemed like it might be a tradition now uh, that, uh, that if I have any unrepaired watches, and I do have some more, I'll just, I think I'll take them to the repair shop on New Year's Eve and have them, have them fixed. Time is, uh, is something that we, uh, we mark in different kinds of ways. We have it down to seconds. We have it down to nanoseconds. And we have it, uh, of course, to days and weeks and months and years. And so, of course, we've marked the time of changing from one year to another this weekend. And time in and of itself is, is a concept uh, of which we are aware and of which, you know, we, um, in which we live every day. And it's, it kind of, sometimes, for me, it can be kind of fascinating. I remember... As a, as a young boy, seeing a movie that was based, based on the, the story written by H.G. Wells, The Time Machine. And I think it was done back in the 50s. But it's about this guy that has his time machine, and he goes, he can go uh, backwards in time, and he goes forward in time. The machine doesn't move, it stays inside of his home. And everything, as he, and as he goes back or as he goes forward, the, the, the building is deconstructed around him or is rebuilt around him and uh, all kinds of things. And, and, and it's just a story about the, the movement through time. And, and personally, I just find that fascinating. I like to read books about that, and, and I like to watch movies about that, so that's a little insight into pastor psyche. I, I don't know why. Um, but it's kind of fascinates, it kind of fascinates me. And, uh, you know, it continues on. People still pick that up. And the Marvel Universe has taken it to a new level with parallel universes that are based on the changes people make in past time. So, so on and so forth. And so, but we live in this universe. We live in this time. Uh, and it is a time where, that God has created. It's a time in a world in which we're living that, that is the work of God's hands. And the Bible says that to, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we are to respond by doing what? Rejoicing in it. So we have this day that has been made for us by God. David Allen Hubbard, a past president of Fuller Theological Seminary in California, wrote this. We cannot face each day 
with the open question, what shall we do? We have to face it with the closed question, what have we already committed ourselves to do? You know, whatever regulates our time curtails our freedom. And that may be one of the things that people are most frustrated with by time is the curtailing of their freedom. They've got a schedule to keep. There are expectations to be met, and I've got this amount of time in which to do it. And sometimes people dream that they could live on some uh, island somewhere in the South Pacific where the temperature is always perfect and the water is always crystal clear. And every morning that they would get up, they go, I wonder what I'll do today. Maybe I'll go scuba diving, or maybe today I'll go surfing, or maybe today I'll, I'll row around the island, or maybe today I'll explore the island. And the only problem is that they're stuck on an island. We're curtailed by not only our location, but by our time. Um, and you've heard the adage, people make plans and God, what, laughs. Our plans are limited and events beyond our control change those plans for us or end those plans. None of us has complete control of our destiny. And that's what the writer of Ecclesiastes is dealing with. That's what he's writing about. Now, the Proverbs encourage us to do certain things to make our destiny secure. So Proverbs 14.8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to understand or know his way, but the folly of fools is deceit, meaning uh, a fool is just kind of, you know, um, whittling away his time, um, and that's deceit. He thinks he has all the time in the world, and he doesn't. Proverbs 2018, plans are established by counsel, but wise counsel by wise counsel wage war. That's basically saying if you're going to get into a conflict uh, of that sort, you better make sure that you have lots of counsel and lay good plans so that you're going to win. Uh, Jesus made that point about nobody goes and builds a tower unless he figure, knows that he can complete it. Um, until, and Jesus is telling us to be wise about that. So in that, we like that kind of advice. We like those kind of proverbs because they give us a sense of control over our life. And yet the proverb also says in Proverbs 18.21, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. You know, we make plans, and, but you know, it's God's plans that are going to be fulfilled in the end. So what are we supposed to do? And the, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, who's often called the preacher, he says, submit. Submit your life to God's purpose and plan. And a little bit later, when we share communion, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And in that prayer, every time we pray it, we say <clears throat> that God's, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We submit ourselves to God's will, to God's plan. Not only here on earth, we, we pray that what's done here on earth will reflect God's will that is established in heaven. So the writer of Ecclesiastes, as he begins his, his book, um, is focused on this, and sometimes as he explains it, he sounds a bit like a Debbie Downer. Um, he, you know, the first chapter, he basically, the summation of that is just life is futile. You know, everything you're trying to do, it's like you're spinning wheels. Um, and the futility is, is more about not being able to figure out exactly what God is doing in the world and get over onto that. But in our text, in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 11, there's this added perspective. There's this insight that is given to us in this little poem that God has given an order for our time in which we can, in which we can recognize and see and enter into and submit. It's a poem um, of, of the changeless ways that God has control over over this world, 
over this time. The, the writer of Ecclesiastes, just as a little aside, writes this poem with 14 pairs of contrasts. There are 14 pairs of contrasts. That's a, that's a double seven, which uh, is called a mirrorism, which is from the same word that we get our word mirror. They mirror each other. And it's employed to help the reader understand that this that this, these times are encompassing everything. The idea is of completeness, that there's nothing outside of this perspective of God's working through our time. And the introduction to the poem reminds us that there are appointed times for everything, for all things. So when the writer says, uh, uh, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity, under the heavens, the idea of a season there is all the activities of a life that one is living are under the appointments of God. There is a time for everything and a season, an appointed time uh, given to us by God for every activity that we live un under heaven. So if you look down through this list, and it really isn't intended, it's, it's the best way to understand this isn't just to, for me to go through each verse and say what each thing is, but I do feel like there's a few of those that I have to just clarify. Uh, the first one that I need to clarify is in verse 3, kill, when it says there is, there is a time to kill, and that is talking more about, not murder, it's not murder, it's saying, God's not saying, oh yeah, there's a time to murder, you know, and there might be wives sitting here today, oh good. That's help. No, uh, it, it is not murder. It's more of the idea of, and, and this sounds harsh enough, but there's a time when you're in a battle that, you know, you have to shoot. Um, there is a time that's appropriate to kill in a war. Um, verse 5, this is, talks about a time to scatter stones and to gather stones, scattering and gathering stones. And there was a, there was a practice, talking about war, that if a, uh, the conquering team won uh, when they left the battlefield of the opponent. If it was on their land, they would throw stones. They would, like if there was a building nearby, they'd tear it apart and throw the stones out into the middle of the field. And so that way they would have a, their enemy would have a tough time cultivating that field again without gathering those stones up. But then conversely or parallelly, there's a time to gather those stones, to gather them up in our own fields and, and use those gathered stones to build something uh, like a tower or a wall around um, the field. There's a time to search and to give up in verse 6. And as I study that verse, it, it seems to have to do with economics. It has to do with investments. It has to do with how you, what you do with your money. Um, so there is a time to search. There's a time to look for places where you can invest yourself. And there's a time to disinvest. And, and I know that through this time of pandemic, there have been times when people have fearfully watched the uh, Wall Street numbers going up and down and wondered, should I get rid of that? Should I, should I look for something better to buy? And all that kind of stuff. So they even did it back in the time of the writer of Ecclesiastes. In 7, verse 7, it talks about a time for tearing and a time for mending. And, this, and that's referring to the... the uh, Hebrew tradition of in grief and in mourning, one would rend or tear their garments, their clothes. And, and God says in Isaiah, rend your hearts and not your garments. It's an act of grief. So uh, there's a time that they would rend, or tear their garments in, in grief. And then the, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, and if there's a time for doing that, there is also a time for moving on after the period of, of grief and to sew up. You might meet, not be done in your heart grieving, but sew up what you have torn. So every activity under heaven, God is aware of, has an appointed time for it, and, and allows that time, and gives that time. And so then it concludes in verse 9, what do workers gain for their toil? And basically meaning, going back to what is said earlier, which we did not read in first chapter, it's futile. You know, trying to get out of this pattern is futile. What does a worker gain for his toil? And yet there are, you know, some people might want to answer back, well, we get something, because if I didn't do anything, you know, 
you know, sluggard, go to the ant and see how he works, you know, which means lazy person, get off your bed and go see in nature that there's something to be gained by toiling. But it's, the point is, it's God's activity that ultimately matters. It's God's work among us. We do our part. Um, you know, human wisdom doesn't solve life's questions. Our pleasures don't give real lasting meaning. Death is inevitable. Times and seasons are going to come and to go, and it's relentless. That is the message that Ecclesiastes teaches us, and that it is God's determination by which we live, not our own. On my desk is this little plaque that says, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds my future. The writer's aim is for us to accept God's fixed season, to find our life in the pattern of life he gives for us, and not to fight against the divine timing of God's calendar. But when, it, when things come into our life that we're not happy about, or you know, and there's many times that that happens, to know and to believe that God's grace is there for us to see us through the fixed seasons. It's grace that helps us live in this time. We're called to be vigilant in our living, to be faithful in our living, because God is faithful to us, to trust him, to make sense of the circumstances beyond our control. That's how we stay sane in this crazy world. So in concluding, in verse 10, it says, I've seen the burden God has laid on the human race. I've seen that word burden translated as tasks, and I like that word better. Uh, I've seen the tasks uh, that God has laid on the human race. We all have tasks. Uh, and in verse, chapter 1, verse 13, that task is defined as to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. We might not be able to control it, but we can come to a place of understanding of it, and that is our task. And it's given to us by God to understand that the purpose of our life is something that God has given to us and intends for us to have. You know, I don't see everything. I don't get it all. But I know that God does, and he's calling me to step forward. I think about that passage of scripture that I learned when I was a little kid. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that is more about trusting God's truth than anything else. I can't see what is at the top of the staircase in an unlit hallway. But if I have a light, a lamp, a candle, I have enough of a glow at my feet to see the first step up, and to trust him for whatever is at the top of the staircase. Verse 11 says, he has made everything beautiful, everything appropriate is the better translation. He has made everything appropriate in its time, in its place, in its order. God has made everything appropriate and beautiful for us. He has set, and this is a beautiful verse, he has set eternity in the human heart. Think about that. With all of the things that I've said this morning and everything that the writer of Ecclesiastes says, there is this um, confession, this admission. Whatever. Even if we can't do anything about it, even if it gets frustrating for us not to understand everything that God is doing, we have this one thing that we can know is true, that God has set eternity in the human heart. Animals don't know about eternity. Non-sentient things don't know about eternity, but humans know that we are made for more than this time, but for eternity. Jesus has come into the world so that we can know there is an eternity set before us in which we live, in which we can know, in which we can 
celebrate God's presence. That has been placed in our hearts by God. We can't get it out of our heart. We can ignore it. We can pretend it's not there. But God has set that sense of eternity in our heart so that we know we are made for more than this world. We're made for him. And God has made it so that we can be with him, that the things that would keep us from living in eternity, our sin, our brokenness, our failure, our faithlessness, can be laid upon Christ by faith and we can be forgiven. And that eternity becomes a reality for us. This morning, as we prepare to come to communion, let the eternity that God has set in your heart echo. Echo to Christ, who's come to open that eternity for you and for me. Lord, help us to recognize who we are, created by you, not just meant for this world, but created beings for eternity, and that you have done everything in your Son, Jesus, so that we can enter into that eternity with joy. In his name we pray. Amen. If you are able, would you please stand with me as we share our declaration of faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he had ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Would you please remain standing as we make our confession together? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart, 
we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways, to the glory of thy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ has died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let's take opportunity to pass the peace of Christ uh, with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace and also with you. <clears throat> Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You made all things and called them good. You gave a season for everything and a time for renewal of the old. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, who lived and taught a life of compassion by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. For you have promised a new order in which all tears will be wiped away and death shall be no more. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. So if you now take the communion element that you received as you came in and remove the the, the top thin film exposing the bread and then hold that in your hand. The body of Christ that was given for you, Christ's body was broken for you on the cross. Take and eat this in remembrance of him and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And then remove the second seal. The blood of Christ that was shed for you. Christ shed his blood on the cross for the forgiveness of your sin, my sin, the sin of the world. Take and drink this cup in remembrance of him. And now together let us pray the prayer. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Bless us that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If you're able, would you stand, please? And now, may the God who set eternity in your heart lead you and guide you in all the times and patterns in which you will move this day, this week, this month, this year. And as you move, may you know that you don't move through life alone, but that the Lord Jesus has come to walk with you every step. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.